about 111,000 low-income African Americans were forced to move out of their homes in between 2000 and 2013, according to Mock 2019. This displacement was not the result of government interaction, but rather economic forces through gentrification. Gentrification has been a buzzword in urban planning conversations since the mid-1960s. In post-white flight redlining America, inner cities were becoming increasingly dangerous, segregated, and under-resourced. As young, typically white professionals and artists began moving into these areas for the lower rent prices, they brought along significant community development with them. Suddenly, coffee shops, art galleries, and trendy apartment buildings become more common in the area. However, this community transformation would usually result in higher rent prices and white movement back into cities. Increased rent prices and the process of tearing down old buildings and replacing them caused many residents to be forced to move elsewhere, according to Richardson et al. 2013. Although gentrification can bring vibrancy, increased safety, and higher home values to an area, it only hurts the low-income people of color who lived in those neighborhoods before, as they can no longer li afford to live in these improved neighborhoods. Gentrification is undoubtedly a word many people are familiar with, but its definition is much less straightforward. In this essay, the word gentrification will refer to the process of cultural and demographic change in urban areas, leading to significant property value changes and an increase in displacement among original residents, according to PBS 2013. It encompasses cultural, demographic, economic, and racial changes altogether. In terms of transformation and reinvention of inner city neighborhoods, there cannot be one without the others, and research shows that about 22% of neighborhoods being gentrified were experiencing high Black or Hispanic loss, once again according to Richardson et al. 2013. Of course, not all gentrification is explicitly associated with displacement, but many factors involved with gentrification encourage it. Studying the economic consequences of gentrification that we currently face would be without purpose if we didn't examine how these neighborhoods formed in the first place. In 1934, the Federal Housing Administration was created, and they developed maps that rated neighborhoods based on safety and stability. As a result, the percentage of Black people in each neighborhood determined how stable it was perceived to be, according to Coates 2014. The overt racism in this mapping caused people to actively keep Black people out of their neighborhoods. It encouraged further racism in the mortgage industry and only prevented the integration of Blacks into predominantly white neighborhoods and vice versa, regardless of socioeconomic status. Further developments in the 1930s perpetuated segregation in American cities. In 1932, planning for residential districts was published. It suggested that cities should be zoned based on types of dwellings, such as multifamily, single family, etc. Hurt 2015. This created more segregation because the traditional single family home is associated more strongly with wealthy whites. By zoning them separately from apartment or other family housing, they prevented them from being exposed to one another. The homogenous dwellings were just another way to keep Black families out of white neighborhoods. As a result of these racist housing policies and an unwillingness by mortgage lenders to help Black families purchase properties, Black families tended to live in the same inner city neighborhoods. These neighborhoods could be, could be comprised primarily of families, but many of them have significantly higher rates of crime, prostitution, drugs, and gang violence than predominantly white neighborhoods, according to Donnelly and Majka, 1998. All of these factors only contributed to the lowering of property values in these types of areas and further isolated the Black families who lived there. White flight and the proliferation of unsafe, predominantly non-white inner city neighborhoods continued until the shift back towards city living began. Post-white flight, many young professionals sought out affordable housing in relatively convenient locations in cities. In many cases, these neighborhoods were the aforementioned lower-income Black neighborhoods. This can be attributed to the fact that, quote, millennial perceptions about race have shifted from those of prior generations, so that minority, mi minority neighborhoods are now seen as cool and edgy, end quote, Richard et al., 2013. As these young people with relatively more capital than the existing residents move in, they tend to attract other young millennials. As more and more of these young, relatively affluent people move in, there becomes a whole new market for upscale restaurants, apartment buildings, and an overall improvement in the conditions in the neighborhood. 
Much of this beautification leads directly into displacement and replacement of non-white folks who live there, with many of the residents protesting artists and describing it as the new colonialism, according to Nazarian 2017. Although the first artists who began to move into an affordable area have the right to do so, and in many cases don't mean to displace or even change the area they're in, they end up greatly hurting the individuals in these neighborhoods. Similarly, they're creating an antagonistic relationship between themselves and the former residents because they're changing the neighborhood without considering the effects of it. It has become clear that gentrification occurs in many American cities, but it doesn't seem explicitly negative. Art galleries, coffee shops, restaurants, and higher property values aren't inherently bad for property owners. It's a great thing. However, Black families have been historically discriminated against in terms of buying property, so many families in these pre-gentrification neighborhoods don't own their homes. Coates, 2014. Once rent prices go way up due to market value changes, these families might be priced out by their landlords, or their homes could be bought and torn down to make room for luxury apartment buildings. Similarly, much of the other economic benefits of segregation, such as better schools, improved parks, and safe streets, don't benefit the people who lived there when had failing schools and dangerous streets. These types of policies could end up benefiting everybody if there was a way to ensure that the people who lived there pre-gentrification could stay. Although it's helpful to understand what happened and what consequences it had, it's also important to explain what should have been done. Philosopher John Rawls' idea of ethics explains that Social and economic inequalities are to be first attached to positions and offices open to all and second to everyone's advantage. In the case of gentrification, the first aspect of this principle isn't as important, but the second is key. For these inequalities to exist ethically, they need to be to everyone's advantage. By its sheer nature, gentrification only benefits those who are already well off, with almost no benefits to those who are struggling. If gentrification occurred in areas where all residents own their homes, it could benefit everyone. If it occurred in areas where gentrifiers attempted to be inclusive and the government policies didn't force people to move when their neighborhoods became unrecognizable, it would be ethical. However, gentrification is not either of those things, and it certainly does not benefit the worse off. There is significant evidence to show how gentrification leads to displacement, but it's difficult to get exact data on how many people are displaced. Some even argue that displacement doesn't occur nearly as often as we think it does, and thus, according to Slater 2006, it should not be a consideration in the gentrification debate. If it's true that people aren't being displaced and get to stay in their neighborhoods, then there isn't a significant moral issue with gentrification. However, even if displacement does not occur, the issues of community integration among different socioeconomic groups still exist. According to a study in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, the greater issue in mixed-income neighborhoods is in the interactions between the existing populations and the new residents. Since many newer residents pay more for their housing, they tend to set their own cultural values and norms, many of which do not align with those of the lower income population. As a result, many low income individuals face a challenging daily experience for many low income residents who feel constrained, observed, and at risk of losing their housing if they fail to toe a particular imposed line defining their behavior and eat even as they recognize and appreciate that their overall quality of and satisfaction with their living arrangements has improved. That's according to Traskin and Joseph, 2013. This evidence reveals an interesting tension in the relationship between gentrification and integration. The biggest issue with gentrification doesn't necessarily have to do with the financial effects on the existing population, but rather how it changes the culture and expectations of the neighborhood. It's not just about having better conditions. Maintaining a community and their right to make decisions about the expectations of that community is equally as important. A neighborhood is about much more than the demographic statistics and census data that you can find about it. It includes rich history, culture, community, and social norms, many of which can vary in a difference of a few blocks, especially for Black, lower-income families and individuals who've been kept out of property ownership in certain neighborhoods due to systemic racism. Taking their neighborhoods away from them is unethical. Many might argue that families can just move somewhere more affordable, but it violates their inherent dignity to force them to live in unstable neighborhoods and then force them to leave as soon as it becomes nice enough for more affluent white people. We should not be infiltrating and profiting from neighborhoods that are struggling. 
neighborhood revitalization prioritize investments into the community as a whole, not just investments into the land the community is on. Gentrification is about squeezing as much profit as possible out of a lower income neighborhood until the residents can't afford to live there anymore. Community renewal solutions should revolve around the needs of the existing community, not replacing them.